right, are looking pretty good, pretty good. So I'd like to definitely say hello to everyone. Um, my name is Lionel Edmonds. I'm the manager of enrollment. And today we'll be presenting from you a webinar on six months as a resident. So all of these physicians are UQ Oshner alumni, and we'll be presenting and kind of discussing about their journey and where they are at today. Um, so today we have for you, um, first up will be Dr. Let's see who we go and which order we'll go with today. First up, we'll have Dr. Marissa Doran, who matched in general surgery at VA Tech. Um, it'll be followed, she'll be followed by Dr. William Song, who matched in internal medicine here in New Orleans at Ashner Health. And then he'll be followed by Dr. Guy Hellman, who matched in pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. Few quick notes before we dive in. Um, if you do have any questions, you can kind of save those to the end. Or if you have anything specific for one of the physicians as they're speaking, please enter your questions into the chat room and we'll forward that to those people. Um, if not, you can hold all your questions till we reach the end. Uh, my counterpart here, Sue, will help man the chat room so we can answer all of your questions. Uh, we do also have our counterpart here from UQ, so we can say good morning to those over there in Australia at the moment. Uh, and we'll go ahead and dive on in, and I'll pass it over to Dr. Doran. Hey, everyone. I'm Marissa. Um, kind of a couple of things to go through, just kind of on the list that Lionel sent. Um, just kind of some background about myself. Um, I grew up in Southern California um, and then did undergrad in New Mexico at the University of New Mexico, and then pretty much went straight into um, the UQ um, Oshner program, um, did six months off, and then um, moved to Australia. Um, I think pretty early on, I had a feeling that I wanted to go into a surgical specialty um, and kind of left it open, was thinking maybe orthopedics. Um, tried to convince myself maybe ED was gonna be the route um, and then kind of um, always came back to general surgery just because it was so, um, I just felt like I could do a lot of things um, and still had opportunities to specialize if I wanted to. Um, as far as the program I'm at, I am so happy. Um, I tried to choose a program that allowed um, early operative experience and then just a lot of I think um, just independence for, for chief residents and um, kind of respected a, a, a life balance. Um, and I think I found the perfect spot in Virginia. Um, our program director is very hands-on um, and everybody is just, um, everybody's willing to teach at every level. Um, the chiefs have a lot of autonomy. They're walking us interns through cases. Um, I mean, I've, I've almost met um, I'm over halfway through on my case um, requirements that we're supposed to get as a second year um, by the end of second year. Um, so I'm just, I'm thrilled. The people I work with are great. Um, let's see. And then the next one is as far as preparation. Um, I feel like UQ did a really good job um, just and, and Oshner as well as I felt like I was given, um, I was given skills that I could, that I could carry on. Um, you know, that, that made me feel confident. I was, you know, and then even just a, a mindset of going in open that maybe they're going to do it a different way than I was taught in med school. Um, and I think just learning how to work with other people is really what had kind of helped me to succeed in the first, you know, couple months. Um, that's kind of it for me. I'll, uh, pass on to the next. We'll go right on over to Dr. Song. All righty. Um, I'm assuming my mic is working, so please let me know ahead of time if y'all can't hear me. I'm Will Song. Nice to meet y'all. I'm a first year at Oshner. I am uh, introduced myself. So, yeah, I'm a well uh, medical journey. So I'm from Los Angeles, California, also a SoCal native. Woo. Um, I went to undergrad at UC Riverside. 
I did a year at uh, Georgetown for a master's program, basically to beef up my pre-med resume. And then I took about six months, was a teacher actually during that time, applied, got into UQ. I was very happy there because who doesn't love going to Australia for two years? Then came here to Oshner and got a lot of clinical experience here. When I essentially, during my med school, I kind of very early on decided, especially during my uh, core rotations, decided that surgery was really fun to watch. I was not a big fan of standing there for six hours on end and not being able to sit down or go to the bathroom or eat. I really, really want to be able to eat and drink while working. And honestly, I loved medicine, um, especially my IM rotation and all the subspecialties. I just had a lot of fun kind of rounding. I know people aren't really a big fan of that, but I loved rounding. I like all the, uh, the kind of variety of cases that you get to see. I like the uh, kind of continuity that you get from a day-to-day -day basis, being able to um, kind of go from patient to patient and kind of follow their journey from their admission to the hospital until they're uh, ready, ready to be discharged. As far as uh, kind of transition from med students, from a med, or sorry, how do I find, yeah, transition from med student to a resident. I found the transition to be as kind of intimidating as everyone kind of says it to be. Um, I loved it, to be honest, because as a med student, and I don't know who the demographic here that we're talking to, but if you're a third year and you're just starting off during the year, you'll realize that as a med student, it's kind of intimidating kind of being in a hospital, you're following patients and you don't really know what you're doing. Uh, as a fourth year, you kind of know, have an idea of what that's like. As an intern, it's even more so like that, where you don't know what you're doing and you're kind of just kind of treading water and feeling like you're you're trying not your best not to drown but now that it's we're like six to eight, or basically eight months in within the first few weeks to the first month we kind of you you learn to survive you learn to really kind of thrive in your specialty and it's something that you don't really kind of you're not really conscious of it just really does happen out of nowhere just by by nature you're just exposed to it so heavily that you kind of have to you just, it's not you have to, and you don't feel the pressure. I mean, you feel pressured for sure, but it kind of just happens naturally, really. So the transition for me was was very quick, very intense, but very, very rewarding at the end, because now just thinking back on it, I feel like I you, you learned so much in the last six to eight months as a resident, as an intern, really, then I feel like I really did um, through, you know, all the years of pre-med, all the years of medicine, or all the years of uh, med school, because you're just kind of in the thick of it, and you're kind of doing so much more. Uh, as far as why did I choose I am an Oshner, uh, during my rotations here, I absolutely love the faculty. I love the upper levels, the, um, the residents that we worked with. I felt like I learned a lot. I felt like they had a lot of support. Most important to me was the culture of the residency. I felt like um, there was so much teaching and so much uh, kind of backup in terms of you know them treating their interns right. Um, there is a lot of camaraderie there, and I really wanted that to, I really wanted that during my training. So um, that's one of the main reasons why I ranked Oshner as high as I did. Um, and then how do I compare, how do I think I compare it to other med grads? There's always going to be a, a sense of imposter syndrome. I think you're always going to feel like, you know, everyone else is smarter than you. Um, but honestly, uh, I, my co-interns are fantastic. I love them. So many of them are from LSU, from Tulane, from a lot of them are, you know, DOs. A lot of them are, you know, American medical graduates as an IMG, uh, from UQ. I don't feel like I'm behind at all. If anything, there are some aspects where I feel like my Australian kind of training and, um, being here at UQ and being here at Osher and then already kind of already working with this demographic. You, if anything, I feel like I have a leg up a lot of times. Um, one thing to not, that I'm not taking lightly is the fact that because I've had the experience of working at Oshner as a med student, I'm very familiar with the hospital. I'm very familiar with the Epic system. I'm very familiar with a lot of the faculty. So it actually made my transition much easier um, compared to my uh, out of state co-interns. But I feel like I compare pretty well compared to them. Um, I mean, I still feel that I'm not the smartest one of all of them. I definitely feel some of them are smarter than me, uh, but I definitely feel like um, UQ definitely trained me well to uh, to kind of thrive as a as a resident. I think those are all my questions. So. All right, thank you, sir. Now we'll move over to Dr. Hellman. Hey, uh, I'm Guy. I grew up uh, on the East Coast, um, so far from uh, Marissa and Will. Um, but yeah, grew up in Princeton, New Jersey. I went to undergrad in Washington, D.C. Um, and during my final year of undergrad, I started working at the Children's Hospital in D.C., Children's National, um, which is where I kind of got my start in my medical journey. Um, I did a couple of years as a research coordinator there in the neurogenetics division before um, ultimately going on to UQ, uh, where I did an MD-PhD. Um, 
Uh, so alongside my medical studies, I did a PhD in genomics. Um, and uh, then through that time, decided to uh, apply into pediatrics. Um, and uh, during my clinical rotations at, at uh, Oxner, I was really figuring out kind of where I wanted to be. Um, my, my PhD had been very focused on neurogenetics and I was very kind of sold on that path, but realized more and more as I got into the clinical realm that my clinical and research interest didn't totally align. And um, eventually I found the, the pediatric ICU or the PICU. Um, I really loved the environment there. I loved working with families. I loved working with the team. I'm in mean, that setting. I loved the, the medicine and um, everything that we, we discussed as a team to provide the best care for our patients. And so I ultimately decided that post uh, medical school, I want to pursue a career in critical care. Um, and that landed me at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia or CHOP, um, as you may hear me uh, refer to it, just because that's a lot easier. Um, and so I, I am now six months into, uh, six to eight months into intern year here. Um, the transition, uh, it's, it's quite overwhelming. My hospital is, um, I think, about as close to the size of Oxner Hospital as, as, you know, just a pediatric hospital, a standalone pediatric hospital. So it's been, you know, size-wise, it is, it is comparable to, to what Oxner has been, um, but on, just on the pediatric setting alone. So that's been um, kind of overwhelming um, in some ways, but also a lot of fun because it is definitely the demographic where I, I, I feel um, that I am kind of best served. The, you know, the, the medicine, you know, is always going to take time to, to come along. Um, and we, you know, we also have the, um, the challenges of, you know, really providing kind of care to the family um, uh, in and of itself too. But our program has been really great about easing us into that transition. We, you know, we start off with an orientation and we start off with a, a graduated autonomy scheme. So, you know, we're kind of, they, they recognize that we, we come from, you know, being fourth year, med, fourth year medical students and uh, we're eased in a little bit. Um, but by the time you're two or three months in, uh, you know, you kind of have your feet a little bit more on the ground. You recognize the team structure, you recognize the hospital structure. And uh, it then becomes uh, much easier and you find yourself kind of taking on different roles in, in the various teams that you're on. Um, our rotations flip a lot too. So we do a lot of it, you know, kind of adjustments on the fly. And I think that's one thing that, um, you know, has helped me to just be ready to kind of transition over to, to a new role. Um, whether it's, you know, I'm covering our general pediatrics team and then switch over the next day, I'm solely working with uh, endocrine patients or, or going to the ED or going to the well nursery. Um, so I think the, the transitions within just our, like our block structure and our small block structure have been really helpful. In terms of choosing, choosing CHOP, um, you know, it was, it's definitely kind of a, a dream come true. It's not something that I would not have thought would have been possible um, kind of going into the program. Um, uh, specifically, I think the reasons that I chose CHOP were um, that I knew it was going to be a, a high volume hospital where I was going to see everything I needed to see more. And I see probably a lot more things that I would never have expected to see than I see are kind of run in the mill um, variant cases. But the volume is so high for us that I, I know that I'm getting all the training that I need. And that was really important to me because I am someone who really learns a lot by, by doing. Um, and uh, the repetition has been, been huge. Our hospital has been full almost every single night um, that I have I've worked at the hospital. I think there has been just one down period. And I think, you know, for a 600 bed pediatric or 600 plus bed pediatric hospital, it's, you know, that's saying a lot. Um, so we are definitely getting the experience that we need. Um, I, I think the other th part of it too, is that I, I was unsure of whether I wanted to pursue a, a clinical, solely clinical career or clinical and academic career. Um, after doing my PhD and I've, I've had the time to kind of figure that out for myself. I was offered the opportunity to, um, fast track my residency and get to fellowship a little bit sooner if I wanted to, by enhancing, uh, by doing a research track. Um, I've ultimately decided not to based on my, my heavy clinical interest in the ICU, but I had that option being here at CHOP. Um, and being in a great academic environment that's well supported by um, the University of Pennsylvania being so close, close by. Um, so those were really kind of the two driving factors. And, you know, um, PEDS, we always joke that like everyone says it's the people, but the people did also kind of play a big part in it too. I felt right at home from the interview day, which was a virtual interview day. Um, and I think that was a really important part of, um, of it for me as well. Uh, the last question that I was kind of posed was, you know, what do my fellow residents think of my med school journey? Um, so I'm the only uh, international graduate in my uh, residency. Um, we do have one, um, one, one new resident who 
uh, is studying as a second year where she isn't attending in her home country. So I'm the only one who's coming from, from medical school abroad. Um, and I, I think everyone is kind of, you know, they're all, all curious, they ask their questions. Most of the questions are about the uh, Australia as a continent, but it is absolutely a unique experience when I talk to attendings, fellows about my experience, they're, they're all kind of like, why did, you know, we're here now, why didn't we do something like that? Because they recognize what a long, um, a long path it is. Um, but they're also, you know, they're also curious about the structure of the program. What do we learn in the Australian healthcare system? Um, and, you know, what were kind of the, like, the facets of the program that I thought really helped me to get to where I am now. So I think that, you know, it's, it, it is a long, hard road and certainly something that, you know, I didn't expect to, to be in this position now, but I think, you know, definitely um, people recognize that it's, it's something really unique um, as we move forward in our, our medical training, especially them having been through the process that it is here. All right, thank you for that. Um, now we'll move on to a few questions or follow-up questions I have for you guys. Um, and we'll just go in the same order as we started. Um, first one we'll go with is, were you concerned about entering the match as an international graduate? Um, I think, yeah. Um, I think overall, um, we were kind of given the, just the advice that we're, we're treated differently than like a U.S. Um, medical school graduate. Um, and just that there's the, the chance that when we submit applications for, um, for residency that we would be filtered out because a lot of people will do, you know, only U.S. schools um, and didn't realize that there's a difference between, um, you know, a U.S. citizen that's at an international school or that we have so much U.S. clinical experience. Um, I think there was, you know, definitely a concern that I would just have to apply more broadly. Um, but I think that because the years before us have done so well and made a good reputation for this program, um, that was that was reassuring. Um, and I know that for my program in particular, we have two graduates. We have one that's an attending now um, and then a chief resident um, that are both UQ grads. Um, and because of their, they kind of paved the way in the program that I'm in um, and I think have earned have earned a lot of respect for being an international grad um, and that it actually comes with, um, you know, a lot of a lot of positives that we're able to work with a diverse um, patient population and we're able to be um, um, flexible with people from different backgrounds because it was, you know, the same in Australia. There's similar um, problems there. Um, that we encounter here. Um, so I think overall, I think the the tides are kind of changing as far as people's perceptions of what it means to be an international um, grad. And I think overall, um, you know, I think it's it, it's been a, a benefit, if anything, because it's 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 kind of set me apart. All right, we'll move on right on over to Will. Um, did you, were you concerned and what concerns did you have? Um, was I concerned about, I guess, matching residents? as an international? Brand. Oh, matching. Oh, I yeah. see. So we're answering the same question. Gotcha. Um, absolutely. Yes. hundred uh, percent. Marissa kind of said it best. It's, you know, we were, to we're told kind of repeatedly, especially once you get closer to the match that as an IMG, um, you know, you're, we are in a different pool, but we are also, there is also a bias. There's a, that's against us, you know, because we're an IMG, we don't we don't have like the same kind of clout that a USMD um, or even a USDO program would have. That it makes it harder for us to match. That being said, though, is that we are US IMG. Um, you know, just from my own interview trail, it it definitely seems as though the fact that we do two years in Australia, but then two clinical years here at Austria, which is a very high end institution, especially in such a large region as the South, and it's getting bigger and bigger, right? So the Austrian name really starts to carry weight, especially within recent years. It actually made it easier for me to get interviews at places I actually kind of wasn't expecting to get interviews, especially along the West Coast. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they, you know, now they're getting every year, there's more and more graduates from Austrian med schools, um, and that go to really well, well known residencies, and then also Austrian residencies that uh, kind of split off from the South and go to other uh, hospitals around the, the country 
So then they also know about the entrepreneur name, they know about the UQ name as well. And they show that there's really no kind of, there's really no reason to bias against us, against us as UQ grads, despite being IMGs. And if anything, it actually kind of, I, I tried to play that as an advantage moving uh, during my interviews because, you know, who else can say that they did two years in Australia and two years in New Orleans, right? Um, so I was definitely concerned. Um, and sorry, what was the other half of that question? Oh, what, like what concerned me? Like what's yeah, the concern? Yeah, what, most of it. <laughs> yeah, um, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, so definitely concerned, and you know, just the fact that we are IMGs, but I think Oshner does a, uh, at the very least UQ. I feel there was a lot of support that you know there was a lot of support, especially during the whole in, uh, interview process, during the whole application process, to make sure that you know, we are well prepared, we know how to answer these questions. Um, and they do a great job kind of just advocating for us and making sure that we are prepared, um, you know, for our interviews as well. So I, I don't think there's much of a disadvantage. I mean, I was concerned for this disadvantage, but then I think you keep prepared as well. So that disadvantage was mitigated. And if anything, and sometimes turned into an advantage. So that's cool. Um, anything different to add, Dr. Hellman? Uh, no, I'm not going to add too much more to that. I think uh, a lot of it has been said. Um, you know, I will kind of just say it's someone who spent like six years around the program and saw a little bit before. The measures are definitely getting better um, across the board. But I think, you know, we all have our, our anecdotes of how the match process went for us. I know, you know, I, I also, I, I did have concerns. Um, I will, I will not say that I didn't have concerns. And I think you know, having talked to some people after the process and kind of talking through my experience and, you know, where I interviewed and, you know, places that I, I, I didn't get interviews that I thought I would actually be a really strong candidate for and really like um, programs. Um, you know, it, there is there is something there. But again, I think that the the things are, are getting better uh, across the board. And I think coming from somewhere like Oxner that, you know, is, is growing in reputation um, that does provide us uh, kind of everything we need to get our feet, uh, you know, get us the the clinical experience we need in all medical disciplines for whatever we want to apply into is is really important. So, all right, thank you. Uh, next question. Um, again, we're just going the same order. Um, how and or why did you choose UQ Oshner? Um, so I kind of had a similar answer to Dr. Hellman. Um, I played um, volleyball at the University of New Mexico, and part of our um, summer training, we went and played um, some international, um, some national teams, basically, um, as and the um, Australian national team hosted us. And so I got to spend two weeks um, in Brisbane and in um, Melbourne, and I just loved it. And I had always known um, I wanted to go to med school. So I got back from this trip and I literally Googled like Australia medical school. And the UQ program popped up and a couple other um, like four year programs that were all just strictly international um, in Australia. Uh, but this one really stuck out to me because um, I was given, um, you know, the two years there, but then still had ties to a US um, institution. And that was really important to me. Um, and then ended up going to like a kind of an event like this where they had some some graduates talk about their experience. And I was like, you know, they, they kind of said, you know, if you're somebody that can, you know, I guess, hold your own and is an, is, is an adult learner and motivated, um, this is a program that you can really set yourself apart with. Um, and that really stuck with me. And so I kind of just, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go for it. And I applied um, and I got in, I haven't really looked back. Um, it was the greatest Google search probably <laughs> I've ever done. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Song. Uh, okay, well, I'm so no shame in admitting this. It was the only program I got into. Um, I had gone to Georgetown for the special master's program, and I, um, you know, I did I did decently well, but unfortunately, my I, um, I got through the interviews, but then I wasn't, I didn't get into the Georgetown program, but luckily Georgetown itself actually apparently has some connections through UQ and they've actually matriculated a lot of students throughout the years, especially that special master's program. So they actually advertise pretty well. And then I kind of just on a whim decided, you know, I'm going to look up this program. I applied, um, looked up like their history, I actually got in touch with a couple of um, current students and uh, some alumni 
um, that were actually at Georgetown from the UQ Oshner program, like they were residents there. And, you know, it kind of intrigued me, the whole kind of being able to travel Australia and everything. So I applied and you know, got the interview and then I got in and then that's when I told my family, it's like, hey, so I'm going to med school, but it's in Australia. And they were essentially surprised um, and kind of very supportive. And I kind of haven't looked back since. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hellman. I mean, uh, I, I I always said it to program directors when they asked me, it was like, you know, the short story is I didn't get in anywhere else. Um, and, uh, you know, um, but the long story was um, I actually was doing research um, uh, at Children's National before I came and we were working with a group at the University of Queensland. And so when I was applying, I kind of knew that that was always uh, going to be a potential option that I could continue doing research and something that I was really enjoying. Um, something that I had put really like two or three really like very invested years into. Um, I was had ongoing research projects with that lab directly. Um, and so I was able to kind of just switch over to, to working more on the methods development um, and kind of analysis with that group um, when I when I applied. So, you know, for me, um, the, the, the research appeal was great. UQ is an, a, a fantastic academic environment. Um, there's really a, a lot of cutting edge research globally um, that comes out of UQ. I mean, you look every other day, there's some fantastic new new paper or, you know, vac or vaccine work or, um, I, it, it's really, it's hard to keep up um, with a lot of the work that comes out of UQ. So if you're looking for somewhere where you can kind of get a sense of some academic interest, then, you know, UQ also, you know, really um, is, a, is, a, is a very fitting place to be. Um, I think the other thing too was, um, uh, you know, I had some family in Australia, so that was also appealing um, for me. But like Marissa said, if you are a very self-driven person and, you know, you really want to be successful and kind of take advantage of everything, then this program is, is perfect for you because it doesn't, it doesn't feed you everything that you need. Um, and I, I will say that you have to really, you know, want to, you know, succeed and put the effort in. And I think if you do that, you show your, your A, your curiosity, your adventure side, and, you know, B, you kind of you go on this global journey that, you know, you come back with lots and lots of stories, um, but also, you know, a, a very, you know, rigorous uh, medical, um, uh, medical background from. Um, it's, it's really, it, it's huge. And I think those are all the things that I, you know, maybe didn't necessarily know all at the beginning, but they're the things that I kind of recognized myself from before I went to medical school and things that I definitely got out of the program coming out of it. All right. Thank you. Next question. Uh, just want to make sure to let our guests know you can enter your questions into the chat room at this time. If you do have any questions, uh, please go ahead and enter those into the chat room. Uh, but we'll keep on going. Next question. Um, being you, that you guys started your residency on the back end of the COVID pandemic, how has that experience been? Um. You know, I think I really, through the COVID stuff, I think I owe a lot to the class ahead of us. I think they really trailblazed um, a lot of the uncertainty that there was regarding interviews. Um, so I think could just kudos to them because they they passed down a lot of advice as far as navigating a totally virtual um, interview experience. Um, then I think, you know, as far as starting in the hospital, um, you know, I think for for us, or at least for me, I think my my background at Oshner wasn't too much affected by COVID stuff. I felt like I didn't miss out too much on um, experience because of limitations there. Um, and then going into the hospital here, I think that the kind of setup that there was, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like it's it's truly taken a negative toll on. Um, on my experience. Um, I think that certainly some different things have come up as far as, you know, other residents testing positive for COVID and then having to, you know, cover certain um, situations. And I think you kind of just have to really rely on um, um, teamwork in that, in that sense to get through. Um, I think that's kind of all I have to comment on that. Okay, Dr. Song. So how, wait, so how did the tail end of COVID, how did that affect like, yeah, of my how's your experience be? Yeah. Um, 
I will echo what Marissa says. A lot of it has to do, will be owed to the class above us because um, they're the ones who kind of started in the middle of COVID and the class above that as well. They kind of were in the middle of their intern year when COVID all happened. So they kind of uh, trailblazed the whole kind of how to, how residents should navigate through the whole COVID thing, especially here at Ochsner. Um, I will speak on it because we were students essentially. So Marissa, Guy, and I, we were third year med students uh, kind of just starting off our third year rotations when COVID hit. So we were kind of also, we kind of witnessed how kind of on like upside down, everything was turned, especially for residency programs. Um, and I think being on the tail end of that, it's kind of interesting to see that transition because there were so many resident led changes made um, by at least by Oshner to in terms of like COVID precautions and like COVID protocols, because for the longest time, especially when COVID started, residents were just essentially just tossed into the front line and says, hey, so we need like everybody, you're not doing your rotations anymore. You guys have to go into the COVID ICUs and just prone patients and turn them all and learn vent settings and just learn all these new protocols. And patients were, you know, um, residents, interns were all kind of dropping like flies in terms of getting sick with COVID and everything like that. Now at the tail end of it, we have really good protocols in place. And a lot of it was resident led changes uh, that I think we have to thank our, uh, our upper levels for that. Um, I think currently right now we're, we're the tail end of COVID is starting to be, I think we were starting to kind of get so used to COVID as a, as a thing that it's no longer, oh my gosh, this patient has COVID. We, everyone's going to die or whatever. We need to stay away from this room. Uh, it's kind of just, oh, patient has COVID. It's like the patient has a flu. It's, it's another infection that we kind of take precautions with now, but it doesn't really slow us down anymore. I don't think. And it just becomes part of our training. And I think, you know, it, as even throughout my intern year, I realized that uh, as, you know, the COVID patients I've taken care of, the protocol is still changing, right? In terms of, um, you know, precautions and uh, how long they should stay inpatient, how to, how they're treated in terms of, you know, what uh, medications they get and, you know, what their follow-up would be. It's still changing day to day. And it's, um, you know, it's interesting to kind of be a part of that as well. So I think, COVID has changed a lot about residencies in general, but I think uh, we're starting to get to that point where COVID is just becoming a part of is just becoming a part of our lives, um, part of our careers now. So it's not as detrimental anymore. Thank you, Dr. Hellman. Yeah, I, I will also say that you know COVID is uh, a regular thing for us. Um, we actually got hit really hard by the uh, the RSV flu. Um, surge in the pediatrics world. And so, you know, pediatric hospitals across the country were really overwhelmed uh, this fall by that. I mean, and, you know, for, for our, our hospital, which is already in a crunch, we were doubling up bedrooms. We had, you know, beds in the hall in some places. And uh, it, that was truly um, pretty overwhelming for our system. Um, our program was great to, you know, put into a couple measures to, to cap resident teams. Um, at their super cap and you know call the fellows in to to address regular to address surge teams for subspecialty patients. Um, uh, but that's really been kind of the hard one on us. And I think you know um, there was a lot of you know kind of disaster preparedness based on what had happened during COVID. Um, but uh, this also required a lot of planning. And you know we're now just kind of bracing for what is going to be the next thing. So we know that we're going to intermittently get surges with different respiratory illnesses with uh, our pediatric population. Um, but as far as, you know, COVID goes, I, I think, again, you know, for, for us, it is, it is not quite the same as it is in the adult population and certainly not what it was um, one, two years ago when we were going through our medical training. Um, you know, still something that we have to encounter and it's still a big part of our everyday practice, you know, trying to get patients and families to get their COVID vaccines and, um, you know, maintain, you know, maintain precautions, especially when they, they have family members who are sick with COVID. Um, you know, those are the other things that we're, we're kind of fighting against. So it's still, you know, it is still absolutely a part of our practice, but I think that it doesn't kind of have the same measurable effect on, on us, on our day-to-day -day lives in medicine. Um, I think one of the, the curious things will always be what does it continue to do to the, the match process and the residency process, because that's where virtual interviews were brought in. Um, for us as well. And I think that's been, you know, it's been a positive change. I know it's something that's going to stay in the pediatrics world. I don't know what surgery and internal medicine and various other specialties are doing, but I think it has been, you know, a, a, a change there that has made things much more feasible for, for us as applicants too. So I think, you know, the COVID, COVID effect on our world is, is, is different in different ways, 
but I, I think, you know, now we're kind of seeing some of the tail end of, of those changes and what, you know, kind of lasting changes they're going to put into place, which has been, been nice to, to get to that point. All right. Thank you. Um, next question. <clears throat> uh, what advice would you give to someone considering the UQ Oshner MD program? Hmm. I'm trying to think about the things that I guess I wish I would have known going into it. Um, I think I was totally unaware, I guess, um, or just kind of naive regarding like the USMLE kind of process. Um, and uh, I guess now that now that it's changed to, I guess, pass fail, I think just the consideration that, you know, programs do still put weight on that. Um, and I think just, I think just knowing that UQ actually um, and Oshner provided a lot of resources for us and really emphasized um, preparing for that. And so I think that was a huge benefit. Um, I think just, you know, and I think this goes for any medical school that you go to, I think just going in um, open-minded as far as what specialty you're going to be attracted to, um, as well as just um, the knowledge that when you start medical school, all of your kind of undergrad skills as far as how you study is probably going to drastically change just because the amount of information that you have to um, be able to cram into your brain is just totally different. Um, I know that for myself, I you know, I did well in undergrad, so it was a little bit of a shock for me coming into medical school thinking like, oh, I've got these like great study skills. So then being like, no, you don't really, you need to change how you do things. Um, and I think just um, communicating with classmates, picking their brain about how they study, what works for them. Um, taking UQ exams is very different from taking US exams. Um, they truly, I think, I mean, I'll see what Guy and Will think, but I think they truly wanted the the curve to be an actual curve towards a C as opposed to like an A curve, um, which could, you know, it's pretty intimidating. You're like, holy crap, what questions are these? Um, but I think overall, I think it kind of makes you, um, facing some of that adversity and some of those challenges makes you better off in the long run. Now when, um, you know, faced with challenges, it's a little, you know, you feel more comfortable in that you have the skills in order to get through it, as opposed to feeling like you don't know what the other side looks like. Um, so I think in summary, I think just going in open-minded, going in with a, a, a mindset open to change um, and just willing to work hard is kind of the advice I have. All right, thank you. Dr. Song, what advice are you giving? Do it, absolutely do it. Um... I, I love my I love the UQ program and I would 100% do it again. And absolutely, my advice is if you're considering it, do your research, do your due diligence, but absolutely do it. I have no regrets uh, looking back. I met a lot of my you know current best friends from the UQ program and the faculty, the the classmates, even from you know Australia, even from other countries. You it's such a it's such a diverse class that you learn so much. And I I personally loved traveling. I personally loved uh, meeting new people from other cultures and being able to be a part of that and actually share like American culture as well as, you know, my own culture uh, with people that I normally probably would never have met otherwise, I think um, is invaluable. Uh, definitely agree with what Marissa says, UQ uh, does, does their testing and their grading very, very differently. And their focus is definitely different compared to, I would say other med schools, especially in US based. And part of that is keep in mind, though, is that UQ as a med school, their focus is trying to raise good clinicians um, that will essentially a majority of them will will stay in the Australian system. Right. Whereas U.S. schools will their curriculum and their their training and their teaching really is more focused on passing step one and passing step two and then being able to go like match into a good residency. I definitely will echo what Marissa said is that you have to change kind of how you study, especially in the UQ program. Uh, even honestly, from I, I suspect from any undergrad that you're from into any kind of 
uh, like pre-med um, kind of skills that you may have or pre-med uh, strategies you may have, you're going to have to change and upgrade that and kind of tailor it as you go through med school because everything's going to come at you. You know the, that meme where you have the giant fire hydrant that just like kind of splashes into your mouth? Absolutely true. Same thing with internship. The same thing with any step, I think, um, in medicine. You're just going to be bombarded with so much information. You have to be able to adapt and change and overcome and everything like that. So um, my advice is just go ahead and do it and keep in mind, keep an open mind, just like what Marissa says. Things are going to be different. Things are going to not, you're going to be hit with so many things that you're not going to expect. But if you, you know, just look on the bright side, keep it, keep a, keep your head up and say, you know what, I'm never, never take an eye off of kind of what's ahead of you, but always remember the road that's behind you and how far you've come. Because I think a lot of us kind of forget that you see the giant mountain ahead of you and how far you still have left to go. You, a lot of people forget how far you've come already. So just never forget that and just kind of move forward. Thank you for that. Dr. Hellman, what advice are you leaving them with today? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm going to kind of echo what Marissa had mentioned and what I said before, and that, you know, that this is a program that's, it's very self-driven, but that really just gives you the opportunity to kind of pursue what, what curiosities you have, what side of adventure you have. Um, and I think, you know, kind of taking that plunge, taking that next step is, uh, it's really valuable. It takes a lot, it takes uh, a lot of courage, um, you know, to to really make that move to go across the uh, across the world, not knowing anyone, to to then engage in this whole different system, you know, uh, kind of talking to the challenges that Will and Marissa have already described. Um, but I think you know you come out of it with a with a totally different perspective, and you know, kind of building on that perspective throughout the rest of your medical training, recognizing that yeah, there's a whole bunch of uncertainty. That's medicine. I mean, most people will tell you fake it till you make it. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, the, the thing that has always kind of struck me just, you know, knowing my, my classmates, um, who all just graduated is, you know, we, we have this whole other story and a lot more people skills, probably due to the Australian influence that we had, um, than other people that I have met kind of in the medical world at this point. And I think that's really important. Um, I think that you know you're definitely going to get this whole other kind of appreciation for for how medical training is done, how the medical system works, um, and then how you can you can interact with your patients. Getting your training in in Brisbane and then New Orleans, uh, you know, and I think that that is really the like the biggest thing that I can say about the program. Certainly, something that I I feel like I have over some of my other classmates at this point in time. It's an appreciation that like. I remember talking to, you know, a patient at Modern Hospital about their medical problems when I was first learning how to take a straight and shaking and, but like, you know, just sitting there and just being a person and talking to them, you know, it's, it's, I, again, I think I'm rambling a little bit here, but I think that's just one of the things that like, I definitely saw across the board in my classmates at, at Oxner. Um, I definitely don't see it across the board um, in, in other situations that I, you know, in other medical places that I've been. So I would, I would say that would be the one bit of advice that like, if you come to this program, you know that this is something that you're going to get just by virtue of the experiences that you'll have. All righty. Thank you. Uh, any questions in the chat room at all, Sue? We don't have any right now, now I know, but I wish that you guys out there would send some in so we you have a great audience here that can answer any questions that you would like. Um, I see a few people raise their hands. If you guys want to go ahead and just type your chats into or your questions into the chat box, we can definitely get those answered for you. Um, and then we'll just keep moving. Um, so sorry, Lionel, just interrupting. Maybe have a look at your chat settings. Maybe we've blocked them for some reason. That could be why people are putting up their hands. Okay, I'll take a quick look. Let's see. Let's see. Maybe I'll just go ahead and allow them to talk real quick. Oliver, are you there? Do you have a question? Are you on mute? Hi, can you hear me? Sure can. Hi, was, this question, I guess, is for Dr. Hellman. Could you uh, maybe talk about your MD, PhD journey through the program? 
Um, sure. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say this with the caveat that things have changed a little bit. Um, but our MD PhD uh, structure, uh, a program structure at Oxner is, is quite similar to the other US med schools. Um, the program is now uh, two years of preclinical. Um, and then you start your PhD um, and you take your three to uh, two to three years to finish your PhD. Um, most people are, are doing it in about three years full time uh, equivalent now, which is the kind of um, metrics of the Australian system. It's a little bit of a faster PhD than some places in the States, although some places you can get it done in three years. Um, and then uh, returning to Oxner Hospital after that. Um, the, the only caveat that I, I'm just not quite sure of, and just because I know that things were switching around a little bit, is um, if you are close to finishing, but not quite finishing, kind of when you get to that point of the transition to back to Oxner Hospital for years three and four, um, whether or not there's some leeway if you can go at that point uh, or not. But um, there are multiple research programs, and you know I don't want to belabor this two point. If you have any questions, Di Ely is absolutely the person that you should talk to. Um, she was my research coordinator, led me through the entire program. Um, really was a strong advocate for me, both at the um, both as you know at the administrative level, but also uh, on a personal level. She was very connected to me throughout the entire time that I was doing my my PhD and then finishing my my MD studies as well. I'm um, someone who I I really relied on. Um, uh, but the other the other um, components of uh, research degrees within your MD um, include the uh, the M, uh, MD MPhil. Um, so doing a two-year master's as opposed to a, a PhD that can take three or more years. Um, and then also um, there, there was an initiative to do work, uh, to also have a, an MPH on board. Um, so you could do an MP, MD MPH. And I think that was a one-year program. Um, I don't remember any Oxner students that have done that. I know that there are um, a, a number of uh, a number of PhD um, graduates who have finished the program. Again, the, the year after um, I completed the, uh, the program switched a little bit. So um, other graduates have had to finish their PhD before going to their clinical um, rotations. And so that's the other thing that's, uh, you know, kind of been, been changed at that point in time. But it, it is absolutely valuable if you're really interested in research, I, I highly recommend it. But also um, there are multiple, you do not have to do a research degree to get involved at research at UQ or at Oxner. All right, thank you for that. I'll see if there's any more hands up. All right, let's go to uh, V Storma. Can you hear us? Hi, can you hear me? I can. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for hosting this. Uh, my question is, um, do any of you plan on practicing in Australia after your residencies? Yeah, I'm hoping to. Um, I So I actually met um, my partner in Australia um, basically like three months before I left, which kind of sucked. But either way, he, um, he followed me out here. Um, he's totally non-medicine. Um, and got a visa to be here, but kind of our long-term plan is to eventually move back um, to, he's from Gold Coast, so essentially that area. Um, I just knew that kind of the track with surgery um, is a little bit longer. Um, if I would have done my training there instead of a U.S. residency here, um, as far as any of the other steps for it, I don't have too much, too much to offer as um, you know, I just know that our training is recognized there, um, and it's possible to go back. Um, there's actually a critical care fellow, um, currently with us. Um, she did her general surgery, um, elsewhere, and then is now doing, um, her two-year fellowship with us. And she actually wants to go, um, to Sunshine Coast to practice. So I'm hoping to pick her brain when she eventually gets to that point. So I can kind of potentially follow what she's done. Um, but I, yeah, I definitely have hopes of going back there. Um, and I'm not sure if that would be, you know, I'm considering a fellowship. Um, and part of my, I guess, idea for fellowship is going to be kind of geared towards what I think is the best to transition back there, um, whether that's making sure I have critical care, um, kind of certification and training, 
um, or possibly transplant. I'm not sure. Um, that's a great question. I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> Any others planning on returning to Australia, Dr. Hellman, Dr. Song? Uh, I am not planning on returning. I'm trying to figure out. I'm planning on um, PICU, uh, but I'm also considering doing uh, anesthesia as well, um, just as it's <laughs> somewhat commonplace in our institution um, for our critical care doctors to do that. Um, so I am uh, I'm probably not considering that as an option, but um, I have talked to some people about um, potentially doing, um, there are some sabbatical programs of doing a year in Australia. Um, at various hospitals. So I have talked to people about doing that in the past. So that would be something of consideration, but not currently planning to go back and practice there. Uh, as of right now, I'm kind of just more, mostly focusing on trying to survive residency. But I do, uh, I was actually considering just skipping US residency altogether. Actually, during my um, sec first and second year, uh, I had a partner in Australia as well, who um, actually was a uh, um, an Australian um, physician and a graduate of the UQ program, uh, just as a, the Australian side of things. And I was actually planning to just finish my two years in Oshner here and then uh, be one of the students who go back and finish residency in, uh, or essentially continue training in Australia, which we actually do have several um, of us every year um, who kind of do that. So I was planning to do that. Um, however, I realized that Moving forward, my family, almost the majority of my family is here, and I would like the option of practicing here. So in, in order to do that, you kind of have to complete a U.S. residency here. One of our one of my upper levels actually at this at the Austin IM program actually did do exactly what I was saying, which is um, finished the UQ program, went back to Australia and practice for a year and then actually came back here to finish a U.S. residency. So she would have the option of doing both. Her partner is Australian as well. Um, so she actually is she's completing residency here. So she she has the option to do both. I may actually, may or may not actually go back and do kind of what um, Guy was mentioning, which is kind of doing uh, a short term, like one year, one or two year, uh, kind of being like a traveling doctor type deal. Um, but I think having a residency, having a US residency completed will keep doors open and uh, kind of make me available to practice almost anywhere I really want to, uh, specifically in the US if I choose to come back afterwards, so. No concrete plans now, but it is on my mind. All right, thank you. I don't see any more hands. So I think we'll end with this final question for each of you. Oh, we do have one, let's see. Sharma, can you hear us? Yes, so uh, my question is that the program starts in January, but the residency programs in the US start in July. So is that, has that been cause for concern? Or, and, uh, you know, what do you do in that in that interim period? Thank you. It was the greatest, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I think that it really, one, it gives you an opportunity to, you know, take a vacation, celebrate graduating from medical school. I went to Europe for two weeks um, and then came back. Um, also, it gives you an opportunity to take step three um, which was hands down the best advice I got was to complete step three before starting residency. Cause I'm looking at some of my co-residents that are having to juggle stuff in the hospital and study for step three. Um, and I, you know, that was great. Um, and then I know that the downside is obviously I was like, how am I going to financially <laughs> live for six months? Um, I ended up getting a job as a waitress and like a bartender for six months, um, which kind of threw me off because I was making pretty decent money. <laughs> and so, um, you know, but that was, that was kind of cool for me. I was working at a nice hotel bar, um, and it was, it, it kind of brought some, um, I don't know, some balance in a sense to kind of just get some work that was totally unrelated to medicine. People had no idea I was a doctor, um, and they just kind of, you just kind of get to talk to people. Um, I know some people did some research, um, in the meantime, um, you know, which is kind of great to have some dedicated research time. I kept up with some projects, um, still at Oshner and then was able to go to a conference. Um, so I think you can kind of get creative during that time, but I, I thought it was awesome. Yeah. Not an issue at all. <laughs> I uh, definitely had 
no concerns whatsoever um, because there's so many of our uh, upperclassmen kind of gave us really, really sound advice. Marissa is absolutely right. Taking step three before residency starts, 100% the best thing you, we could possibly do, um, especially now that I'm kind of sitting here watching my co-residents kind of struggle with trying to balancing that uh, that studying while also dealing with clinic uh, uh, rotations and everything like that. Um, I actually, so I, I didn't do anything as cool as learning how to bartend, um, but I did uh, I did actually go back into teaching. I was a, I basically just subbed for six months. And since everything was virtual, I actually took advantage of that and actually traveled. And I was basically um, a virtual, <laughs> which was actually a very, very interesting situation because, um, you know, there wasn't a surprisingly there was still a demand for substitute teaching um even during the virtual setting and everything so i was actually i went to taiwan i went to mexico i went um i went to uh bali and went back to bali um and everything and it was a fantastic time uh i was actually in in uh in mexico when the whole match process happened so it was uh it was i completely i had actually forgotten that it was match week <laughs> um when i got the news and it was because i was like scrolling through instagram that i saw people were posting their match results i was like oh right that that happened and i checked my email and I, and I got that um but it was that kind of break that you have very very much needed i think you know especially towards the end when you know you know you matched and you know where you're going and you know for the last for that you know three four months you're so relieved it's so much better to be able to actually completely go hands off do anything that's not medicine related and not have to worry about finishing up clinicals that you really kind of don't care about the whole senioritis thing that everyone always know like talks about especially from like um you know my co-interns were talking about like during their last few rotations they were doing bare minimum to show up for like an hour or two and just to get credit and then just immediately like leave because they already matched they really didn't care to put too much effort into that i, I think that we didn't have to kind of worry about that because we were completely off already um and i think that really helped and just especially towards after we finished after we graduated from the program we still had like a month or two of interviews to do and we were able to focus our entire energies on those interviews so that really really helped as well um and then just being able to let loose and have fun and you know kind of completely disconnect from medicine for for a solid six months was was absolutely invaluable i think so it was it was very fun Yeah, I won't belabor the point. It was uh, it was really nice to have that. I um, I did some part time research. I coached water polo, um, which is something that I used to do before I went off to to medical school. I love doing, um, and uh, and then you know I I went and visited family abroad. Um, I caught up with friends that I hadn't seen properly in in some time. Um, and just know that you uh, again when you like think about that time, um, your your American colleagues have pro probably been done before we finished. Um, but we have a nice structured fourth year, which I think is great. I mean, I'd love a little bit more elective time in there. Um, but but to be honest, you know, some of the, the rotations that we got, like I had a Pete's ortho week, which was probably the only time I've ever enjoyed clinic in my life. And, you know, it was great. And uh, there's there's a number of things that happened during the, that structured fourth year, which uh, a lot of the US med schools don't have. And I think is, is, really, um, is really helpful. Um, the other thing too is that there are research scholarships offered by UQ, so you can apply for one of I think it's eight awards, and it's a it's a it's a small award to fund your six months off while you do research with someone um, uh, based out of Oxner. I did not do that, but I know we have a number of classmates who did that. They ended up going back and presenting in New Orleans um, in the late spring. So it's um, you know it's it, there's plenty of opportunities but i think more so than anything you're going to be going into a you know really fun filled but also overwhelming residency year so you should definitely take that time to relax um and take step three which i did not do all right thank you definitely thank all of you uh want to say thank you we've come to the end of our program for today uh -huh. yes let me interrupt um guy would like to share his contact information with our group we and just entered it into the chat room. I can yeah, why not? I think only us can see the chat. It says okay. host and panelists. That's the only thing that I was worried about. But I'll send it to everyone. Give me one second. To everyone. I put my email in there as well. I'm happy to um talk to anybody that has questions. Thank you guys, it's very generous. 
Got it. Yeah, so we're at the end of our program for tonight, this evening, or this morning for our UQ counterparts. Um, so we'd like to say thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Duran. Thank you, Dr. Song and Dr. Hellman for joining us and giving us your information tonight. Um, thank you to all of our guests for joining us also. Uh, one more, I'll put Dr. Song's information in before we close it out. Um, and we look forward to seeing you guys next month for our next webinar. And everyone have a good evening. Thank you.